Assalamu alaikum everybody. Today we will be looking at Listeria monocytogenes. But before getting into the video, I'd like to tell you guys that these videos are meant for educational purposes. Things and treatments may change with time. If I get wrong or miss anything, your input is always welcome in the comment section. So let's jump straight into the video. But before talking about Listeria monocytogenes in detail, we should know about the classification of bacteria. Bacteria are classified into spirochetes acid fats, mycoplasma, and on the basis of gram staining into gram negative and gram positive. We are not concerned here with gram negative as we are talking about Listeria monocytogenes and that's gram positive. Gram positive are further subdivided into cocci and rods. We are done with cocci. If you want to know more about cocci, browse the channel. Rods are further subdivided into spore forming, we are done with them too, and non spore forming rods, which are further subdivided into filamentous like Gardnerella vaginalis, Nocardia, Actinomyces, and non filamentous like Cornibacterium diphtheriae and Listeria monocytogenes, the topic of today's video. Non spore forming rods can also be classified as aerobic and anaerobic. If they are aerobic, they will be motile and immotile. The immotile are Nocardia asteroides and Cornibacterium diphtheria, while the motile is the Listeria monocytogenes. Listeria monocytogenes is the small gram positive rod. It is a robe, but it can be a facultative anaerobe. It is intracellular. It is weakly beta hemolytic, which means that it will form a small clear zone in the blood agar. It is pleomorphic. Pleo means many and morph is for shapes. It means that it has got many shapes, not actually many shapes. It occurs in rods, but it forms V or L-shaped formations under microscopes. That's why it is called pleomorphic. It is catalase positive. For those of you guys who do not know what is catalase, it is an enzyme that converts hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen, and oxygen is responsible for forming bubbles. One really high yield thing that I want to mention here is that Listeria grows well at cold temperatures. Listeria lives in food, we are going to talk about its habitat in a moment, but now let's focus on the cold temperature story. So storage of contaminated food in refrigerator can increase the risk of gastroenteritis. This paradoxical growth in the cold temperature or cold is called cold enhancement. Listeria monocytogenes is non-filamentous, non-spore forming, but it is motile because it exhibits an unusual tumbling motility that distinguishes it from Cornibacterium diphtheria, which is non-motile. Listeria monocytogenes produces a toxin that is Listeriolysin. To be specific, that is Listeriolysin O, LLO. It is responsible for causing listeriosis, meningitis and sepsis in newborns and pregnant women and in immunosuppressed adults. It can also cause febrile gastroenteritis in immunocompetent patients. As you can see in this picture, this bacterium is purple colored which shows that this is gram positive and is rod shaped. Lecture outline, we are done with the introduction and classification. Now we'll be looking at morphology habitat and transmission, pathogenesis, clinical findings, lab diagnosis, treatment, prevention, and at the end, as usual, we'll review the lecture. Morphology. Listeria monocytogenes is rod-shaped. Size. It varies in length from 0.5 to 2 micrometers. It's purple or blue in color because of the presence of thick peptidoglycan layer in its cell wall. As you can see in this picture, this is its thick peptidoglycan layer that stained it purple. It is arranged in V or L-shaped form formations when seen under a microscope. And these formations are similar to Cornibacterium diphtheriae. Structure. Being gram-positive, it will have a thick peptidoglycan layer. It is not capsulated, but this organism exhibits an unusual tumbling movement that distinguishes it from Cornibacterium diphtheriae, which are non-motile. It is non-spore forming, but it does produce a toxin that is Listeriolysin O. This is how it looks like under the microscope. This is its rod shape. This is V-shaped formation and also this one is the V-shaped formation. The arrangement that is similar to the Cornibacterium diphtheriae. Habitat. Hosts. Human beings are the hosts but it can be found specifically in the genitourinary area and to be more specific in the female genital tract. This organism is distributed worldwide in animals, plants and soil. 
and from these reservoirs it is transmitted to human via fecal oral route and by primarily ingesting unpasteurized dairy products like milk and undercooked or deli meats, raw vegetables, contaminated food. And it can also be transmitted from mother to fetus or baby because the only passage of nutrition between the mother and the fetus is placenta. So if the mother is infected, the infection will be transmitted from mother to the fetus. It can also be transmitted via vaginal transmission during delivery. When the baby is being delivered and mother is infected with listeria infection, baby will get that infection when it passes through the birth canal. And also the contact with domestic farm animals and their feces. Listeria infection occurs primarily in two conditions. Number one, in the fetus or in a newborn as a result of transmission across placenta or during delivery as we just discussed and number two in pregnant women and immunosuppressed adults especially renal transplant patients why the pregnant women get infected because in their third trimester they have reduced cell mediated immunity pathogenesis the first step in the pathogenesis of any bacteria will be the entry into the human body via ingestion or via skin cut or anything but in case of listeria it is ingestion following ingestion the bacteria appear in the colon that can colonize the female genital tract and from there bacteria can infect the fetus if membranes rupture or infect the neonate during passage through the birth canal pathogenesis of listeria monocytogenes depends on the organism's ability to invade and survive within cells and the pathogenesis is pyogenic type of pathogenesis let's talk about its pathogenesis in detail don't worry this flowchart is as easy as it seems complex let's start the first thing is that listeria will enter the human body and after entry it appears to be in colon and what happens in colon it is exposed to number one gastric HCL, number two proteolytic enzymes, and number three bile salts. And what happens in response to that, the stress response genes of listeria does what? It adheres listeria to human cells. Okay, how? Listeria has got internaline that adheres it to human cells that has E. cadherin. Let us talk about that in more detail. Invasion of cells is mediated by internaline that is made by listeria and E. cadherin on the surface of human cells. That is the human cell and that is listeria. It has got this internaline and the human cell has got this E. cadherin. What happens when they interact? They adhere to each other. Ability of listeria to pass through the placenta enter the meninges, the three protective layers of the brain and spinal cord, and invade the gastrointestinal tract. Depends on the interaction of these two, the internalin and E. cadherin, and the E. cadherin present on these tissues. And what happens when they interact, listeria enters into the human cells. In the human cells, there is phagosome. In some places or books, you'll find phagosome, but in the other, you'll find phagolysosome. What's the difference? Phagosome is just the phagosome and the phagolysosome is the fusion of phagosome with the lysosome. And that's the mature phagolysosome that has a full capacity to kill any microbe. And listeria will be engulfed by that phagolysosome. The intracellular fluid of human cells is acidic. So that acidity will cause listeria to release what? To release its toxin, the bacteria bacterial listerial lysine O and what will that toxin do? It will form pores in the cells that will help the listeria to escape from phagosome and enter into cytoplasm of the cell and thereby destructing the phagosome and also it will release phospholipase C. This is an enzyme. It will does what? It will break down the phospholipid of phagolysosome and its cell membrane. Now this sac having the listeria is destroyed, so listeria is free now. And it will enter the cytosol, means the cytoplasm of the cell. As now listeria is present in the cell, let me tell you something really amazing. Listeria will enter the cell 
Listeria produces listerolysin and it escaped phagosoma and it's now in the cell. What's the amazing thing that I wanted to tell you? It is that Listeria monocytogenes can move from one cell to the other by means of actin rockets. What are these actin rockets? I'm glad you asked. These are the filaments of actin. They polymerize and propel the bacteria through the membrane of one human cell into another and like that bacteria is moving from one cell to the other and is spreading the infection as listeria preferentially grows intracellularly cell mediated immunity is more important host defense than humoral immunity suppression of cell mediated immunity predisposes to listeria infections we are almost done with the pathogenesis but let's talk about the virulence factor the first virulence factor that played a major role in the pathogenesis of listeria monocytogenes is internalin that does what it helps the listeria to attach to the host cells the second virulence factor is a toxin released by listeria monocytogenes and that is listeriolysin O the LLO that does what it helps the bacteria to escape from the phagosome destruction and get into the cytoplasm of the cell to actually cause infection the third virulence factor is the phospholipase its action is similar to listeriolysin that is to help the bacteria escape the phagosome and get into the cytoplasm the fourth virulence factor is the actin rockets or the actin polymerization the act a they does what they allows bacterial movement between the cell the rocket tail that asymmetrically connects to host cytoskeleton propelling the pathogen between the cell and the fifth virulence factor is survival at low temperatures low temperatures induce rna helicase that stimulate the replication of bacteria bacteria will also form biofilm at low temperatures the flagella propulsion occurs at low temperatures following are the diseases caused by listeria the first one is listeriosis the second one is meningitis the third one is sepsis and we've got febrile gastroenteritis bacteremia and the last one is granulomatosis infantiseptica as its name shows that infants will get that disease clinical findings infection during pregnancy can cause abortion premature delivery or sepsis during peripartum period newborns infected at the time of delivery can have acute meningitis one to four weeks later bacteria reach the meninges via bloodstream so there will be bacteremia the infected mother is either asymptomatic or has an influenza like illness listeria monocytogenes infections in immunocompromised adults can be either sepsis or meningitis and meningitis will have its own symptoms like fever neck stiffness headache altered mental status in immunocompetent patients gastroenteritis can occur and that will be characterized by watery diarrhea fever headache myalgias abdominal cramps but little vomiting live diagnosis of listeria monocytogenes is primarily dependent on cramp staining and culture for live diagnosis we'll need the samples of blood spinal fluid because there is meningitis placenta because mother and baby both are involved and some samples from some of the body tissues and we'll go for gram staining and this bacterium is gram positive because of purple or blue color under microscopy this bacterium is rod shaped and has v or l shaped formations and these formations resemble the diphtheroids of the corny bacterium diphtheria and the bacterium varies in size from 0.5 to 2 micrometers and it's purple or blue in color because it's gram positive as in this picture you can see this is the rod shaped bacterium this one and it has got v shaped formations or l-shaped formations and these resemble the diphtheroids of corny bacterium diphtheria culture colonies of the listeria monocytogenes are small gray colored and they have a narrow zone of beta hemolysis on blood agar plate if the organism found in colonies with listeria monocytogenes then it will be motile and that distinguishes it from corny bacterium diphtheria this is how it's look on culture these small colonies and there is some sort of a beta hemolysis just like that the narrow zone 
of beta hemolysis on blood agar plate. Identification of Listeria monocytogenes is also made by sugar fermentation tests and CAMP test. Treatment of invasive diseases such as meningitis and sepsis consists of ampicillin with or without gentamicin. If this one is not useful, then trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole can be used. And the resistant strains of Listeria monocytogenes are rare. Prevention is difficult because there's no immunization. We can go for proper hand washing and the only important thing we can do is by limiting the exposure of pregnant women and immunosuppressed patients to potential sources such as farm animals and pasteurized dairy products like milk and raw vegetables. Alright guys, let's review everything in this short table. The organism we discussed today is Listeria monocytogenes. It is responsible for causing listeriosis, meningitis, sepsis, gastroenteritis, spontaneous abortion, and bacteremia. It is transmitted transplacently during delivery by consuming certain foods and also fecal orally. Its hosts are humans and the main reservoirs are animals, plants, and soil. And from these reservoirs, the bacteria is transmitted to humans. Diagnosis is primarily based on gram staining, microscopy, and culture. Treatment is done with ampicillin. If not, then trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole is useful. But be sure that ampicillin is given with or without gentamicin. And that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you've got any suggestions, feel free to leave them below in the comment section. And if you want to connect with me on my socials, I've got my Instagram, Twitter, and I'll catch you in the next video. Till then, assalamu alaikum.